pleasure to be here. Thank you for the intro, uh, Porter. Thank you to Filecoin for, for the invite and the ability to talk to you all today. I am going to give you guys one PSA before I start my speech. I don't know if everyone here knows it, but at 20 minutes after the hour, the National Emergency Alert System is going to go off right in the middle of my presentation. So just be aware that's not part of my thing. It's just going to happen. All right. So pleasure to meet everyone. Uh, as Porter said, I'm the uh, founder and CEO of uh, AI Guardian. Um, and I'm excited here to talk to you because both my passion and our mission is on this topic of responsible, there you go, responsible AI. Um, we are at a seminal moment. Um, you just heard a lot about that on generative AI. We're seeing a lot of companies struggling with governance around it as they adopt as quickly as they can. Um, and what I want to talk to you today about is, actually it's nice that this dovetails with the conversation that just happened. A lot about why we're at an important moment in time, what's driving that, how you need to think about generative AI within your organizations. Um, but then responsible AI coming in as a foundational part of that adoption curve and why that's going to be important. And really what you can do to institutionalize it in, in the enterprises you work in or work with. Okay? So let's just talk about this up front real quick. Um, we all know the promise of AI. I think the important thing I want to build off of the last conversation, though, is one of the points on here. Um, the last speaker talked about um, AI transforming 50% you know, of workers' uh, you know, jobs at a 50% or greater pace. The truth is we're still in the early stages of this. Most people in our society are not the folks like us in this room who are knee deep in these, in these areas. Um, most people are vaguely aware of generative AI and what it is, obviously through headlines. But just like the early days of the internet or other wave technologies, most have no idea today and can't imagine how it's going to affect their lives, their jobs, their communication, et cetera. And so it's going to be an interesting area where we have to think about um, the responsibilities that go around along with this technology. There are unique risks to generative AI. Um, some of them were talked about, biases, transparency, IP issues. You're going to have a wave of security issues. You're putting extremely powerful tools in the hands of not great actors. And you're going to have cultural and social disruption. Jobs will be affected. Um, the way you go about your day will be impacted for positive or negative. Um, and if we know one thing about most people, rapid change is, is not something they embrace out of the gate. And so we need to think about both the upside and, and the perils that we need to challenge ourselves on. And I think the, the intro speaker mentioned it well. She mentioned Cambridge Analytica. Avoid our Cambridge Analytica moment in this space um, that drives slower adoption of what we're trying to do. Now, on the wave technology side, the thing I want to talk about real quick as a, as a starting point is why is this a unique moment in time? Uh, why now? Um, we have a tendency in tech to hype things up. Um, you, you all know the hype cycle uh, charts out there and where we stand on it now. Um, but I do think, sincerely, this is a little different. Um, and it matches up with the other waves that we've seen, whether it's Web 3.0, it's the internet way back when, social, mobile, SaaS. Um, in that you have two very distinct, powerful macro trends coming together at this moment in time. So to the point being, there's a reason this didn't happen 10 years ago. It's a reason it's not happening 10 years from now. The first is that leap forward in computational power. Um, you had five generations or five, 50 years of Moore's Law, which we all know, um, 21 months to double computing power. The last decade plus, we've kind of Moore's Lawed Moore's Law. Um, we're now at 4x what we were before. And that's allowed us to jump forward in considerable ways. Um, as the last speaker mentioned, GPUs are extremely expensive. That's why NVIDIA is going through the roof. There's a few, few industry areas that that's really taken off. But you've got this macro trend of computational power. On the other side of this, you've got this macro trend of an explosion in big, unstructured data, um, partially driven by all of us in this room and social. We put our entire lives in digital form nowadays. There's people taking pictures right now, posting that to areas like LinkedIn. Hell, there's the Corgi owners, for some reason, taking videos of every Corgi in the world and posting that. Um, and so you've got your entire life on, on the internet now. Um, alongside that, um, <clears throat> we've digitized most things that you could digitize, maybe, maybe not in healthcare yet, but 
we've digitized a lot and brought that into the digital world. As you've digitized that, you've brought people's lives on board, the cost to store data has gone exponentially down. And that's led to a lot of retention of data that we never would have retained before. So you've got an explosion in data being created, our lives being put online, it all being retained. Um, and it's in every form imaginable. So when you have those accelerants, convergence of com computation power combined with giant, vast amounts of data, um, you're fueling what's called neural network development, which is what we know is the underpinning technology of all those LLMs that we know out there. Um, and it's a really interesting backstory on that from a technology perspective, right? Uh, years ago, when you talked AI, most AI was built like most computer programming was. Uh, binaries, zeros and ones, logic trains. Um, and they looked really good early on, but the, the more logic you stacked on top of something, the more it collapsed under the weight of its own logic. Um, and what researchers started to do, and as part of the transformer analysis that was discussed as well, was they started to go from a logic perspective to a probabilistic one. And so what they started to say is, what about if we just guess probabilities? Um, and just like you as, as a human being, that's how we develop. That's how our brains work. You as a child don't know what a dog is, um, but you see a lot of them. Um, and you get feedback loops on what's a dog and what's a not. And so even if dogs come in different sizes, shapes, breeds, you have a very good idea of guessing what a dog is when you see it. And that's what these systems are doing. They're taking all of this giant amount of data on the front end figuring out through feedback loops what might be a dog or might not be, or for any of the fine-tuning you know, algorithms that you want to create. And they're coming up, just like your brain does, with a probability of what it's going to be or what the next thing should be or the answer. And so when you have that much going on, you're building very powerful and large neural networks. Uh, we saw a little bit as in the last screen, but here too, you've got ChatGPT3 on the left side of the screen. You're 10xing that by every generation now. And as you 10x it, what we think is exciting and amazing today is going to be child's play in 18 to 24 months. And so when I say this is a wave technology that's going to really be serious in every aspect of what we do, it's because of not what we're even seeing today, but because we know as experts in these fields that what's coming tomorrow is going to be revolutionary um, at the scale we're going. And so <clears throat> when you hear folks like McKinsey or Accenture, right, they tend to hype a little bit too. Um, it's good for their business, but there's real underpinnings to their projections, and many of them are projecting a bigger impact than the internet. Some are predicting a bigger impact than the advent of electricity on our economy, and it's because they're seeing these things coming down the pike, they're seeing where this is going to go, um, and we should all take that very seriously. What's really interesting within this, too, is the next level. A lot of wave technologies start in one area, usually in a technical area. We're seeing that some here. But this is a unique wave technology that's going to impact not only every business, but every function within that business. It doesn't matter whether you're in sales or marketing or finance. Um, this is something that's going to rapidly change how you do your job and how your company goes to market. And what's really fun about that is we're going to see two waves of this hit. The first wave is the one we're seeing today. Um, it's efficiency realization. The easiest thing for us as humans to do is to take what we're doing today and go, well, how could I do that better? That's what all of us are doing right now. It doesn't matter if it's customer support or some other you know, legal document uh, analysis. We're taking what we do, and we're getting better and more efficient at it through LLMs. The fun part about that is as you do that efficiency piece and you bring the marginal cost of what you do, all these scalable, repetitive tasks, you bring the marginal cost of that down to zero or near zero, it opens up the second piece of, of what's going to happen. And that's where the true innovation is going to happen. And we haven't really seen much of that yet. But it's basically going to mean that all the things in your job or your businesses that you always thought was too hard to do, um, too costly to do, didn't scale, all those things open up. And this was always the genius of, of companies like Amazon, where early days they were great at being more efficient online. But they suddenly realized that their efficiency online and what they could do could turn them into the world's greatest logistics company. And that's the power of Amazon today, to deliver at your door in near, near instantaneous time. And so we're going to see companies start to move in that direction over the next 18 to 24 months across all these functions as they move forward. But here's the problem. Let's go back to the perils. 
business risks are going to mount quickly. You're already seeing this in regulatory and legal. Um, you've got lawsuits coming from publishers. Um, you've got IP challenges across the board. That's only going to become a bigger mountain. Regulatory is going to hit with the EU AI Act in Q1, the White House AI Bill of Rights coming probably around that same time. Um, you've got operational challenges. You've seen some companies already pulling back because of disclosures of proprietary information. And then you've obviously got areas like reputational and ethical, your externalities. Um, and you might very well have your Cambridge Analytica moment that kills the brand recognition uh, or, or favorability of a company or two along the way. And so you have to think about these things now, not later. Okay? And as this is happening, it's putting massive stress on governance. Governance for most companies is already not as great as it should be. Um, we were talking about areas with much lower stakes. The stakes are much higher here, and most companies are having, oh, formatting. Um, most companies are having trouble really operationalizing responsible AI. And that's what's leading for most of them to, to kind of adopt a thou shall not policy, right? They're not telling you how to use AI yet, but you've got at least someone in your organization who owns risk management, and they're freaking out. Um, it could be your general counsel, outside counsel, CISO, CIO, CDO, but they're freaking out, and they're issuing memorandums, right? Thou shall not use X um, until we can figure this out. And most of them know they're already starting to break some uh, existing uh, laws that are out there, particularly around data privacy and IP. And so for a short-term solution, it's okay, but you can't compete at the level you want to under that thou shall not eat it. And so that is where responsible AI comes in. So responsible AI is simply a framework of principles for developing and deploying AI in a safe, trustworthy, and ethical way. And I want, if you leave here today taking anything away, what I want you to take away is, it might sound like some jargon to you, but it's actually very simple, right? The, the issue with responsible AI is not complexity. That's not what can, is gonna get in your way. The issue is treating it as a foundational cultural piece that you have focus on as you do AI. Um, that's all it is. And so when you look at these principles, fairness, reliability, security, inclusiveness, etc., cetera, um, they're fairly simple to bring forward if you think about them constantly and bring them into the DNA of what you do. Um, and I love the last speaker. He talked a little bit about kind of we're at the industrialization of AI. I'll use a similar analogy here, right? So when you think about responsible AI, you know, we had this technology called the automobile uh, at the turn of the 20th century that hit the country by storm, the world by storm, rapid adoption, right? And the car was amazing because it could get you from here to there faster than horses or anything else. Um, and of course it took off. Um, but over time, uh, you realize that there's problems and the only value of that isn't just getting from here to there. You might want to get there safely. You had a lot of you know, fatalities early in the adoption of the car. Um, you might want to get there securely or um, consistency, consistently. And so that's what you see with AI too. Just think of AI as getting us from here to there much quicker than we were before. But we need these principles in place to do it at the level we're all going to expect and want as we adopt this technology. So when you think about reliability and uh, safety, you want to make sure that it's consistent in what it's doing as a model or a workflow. You want to make sure that you have an understanding of those outputs and how it's working. Same with security. You're going to want to have the security protocols around this the same way you would with any of your other tech or solutions. And then when you get to areas like fairness and inclusiveness, fairness, the, the amazing thing about AI is it, it's really replicating a lot of how we think and how we come to outputs. The bad thing about it is it brings our worst traits into that world too. So when you have biases in human behavior, it can pick up on those. You need to figure out how to eliminate that. And if you're worried about fairness, inclusiveness is just the way of saying we need a diverse set of stakeholders who are experts giving input to make sure that we are fair, reliable, et cetera. Um, so you want to make sure it's not just a development team or a, a very narrow team working on this. And then when you get to those foundational elements, transparency and accountability, just like on the automobile, you want to look under the hood and know what's going on, that's transparency. I want to be able to go in, understand how this model works, how these workflows work, um, and understand each component of it. A little more difficult in a um, probabilistic model, like a neural network, because every input doesn't lead to the exact same output, but you should have a general range of how that's going to work. And then accountability, uh, the, the last uh, speaker's pyramid was a perfect example of the, uh, accountability. The ability to go in and constantly monitor 
check and ensure that these things are working both from a digital machine side uh, as well as a human side, bringing both those together as human oversight as that gold standard. So when we think about responsible AI, I don't want this to feel like it's a giant thing that can't be tackled. It's just a way of thinking to bring common sense to what you're doing um, in these worlds. Okay. <clears throat> so. With responsible AI, the advantage is fairly straightforward. Again, at the top of this, it gets you from here to there quicker, right? You're able to have improved enterprise decision making, you accelerate your AI adoption, and that's really important. A lot of people think of these things as friction in adoption. It's not. It's the thing that will accelerate your adoption of AI quicker in the long term if you do it right. So it'll get you there quicker. And at the bottom, it's risk management, right? Reputational protection, minimized legal risk, aligned ethical principles. These are all the things that are gonna bite you later if you don't focus on them now. And so when we think about kind of the, the, the role of responsible in AI, I want you to keep thinking. It's very simple to bring in, it's a way of mind, and it's what makes AI adopt quicker. And when we think about responsible AI by design, a couple of principle here's, principles here I wanna go over. First is there's really three layers to this. Um, in the bottom middle is what uh, Scale AI, AI was just talking about. It's data, data model governance, um, testing for bias, transparency, how do we get the data in, structure it, et cetera. And then the second side of that is threat uh, detection, security. Um, there's going to be bad actors trying to do data injection, mess with your model, um, upend what you're doing. Um, so we've got a lot of folks who are focused on those areas right now, including Scale AI. AI. Um, so from a data perspective and a threat detection, pretty straightforward. Uh, where we're focused on and where we want to continue to build awareness is at that higher level of organizational governance. Um, how do you get organizational eyes on everything that's going on AI related? And this goes back to my main point up front. This is in every function of what you're doing. So how are you ensuring that you've got a eyes on governance around what sales is doing in AI, what marketing is doing in AI, what development is doing? Each of them are gonna start running in their own silos. The feedback we get is that they already are. How do you bring that up, create an umbrella program that each of them fit into and work together on? Um, and that is the big challenge that most companies are struggling with right now. So as we think about responsible AI by design, what can you do about it, right? So how do you start to tackle it? Um, and so we look at this as four critical lines of defense that m every company really should get through but many are still stuck at the, the left side of this. So fairly straightforward, comprehend, track, control, manage. Comprehend is understand. We first do by understanding. And so you need to understand the best practices that are out, out there around responsible AI. You need to understand the laws and the regulations that are here and that are coming. Uh, you need to understand the governance frameworks uh, that are going on. Uh, NIST AI, RMF, OECD, others that are out there that can help guide you. Um, once you understand, you can start to track, right? You need to have an understanding of the projects that are in your organizations, the risks associated with those, the hell, the IP tracking that you need to do. And then once you understand and you track, you set up the control institutions. You have oversight institutions like AI committees and ethics committees. You need to distribute policies and attestations, um, control and track that. You need to have training. Uh, almost no companies right now have responsible AI training, and that in a few years will be a given de facto, but it's not there yet today. And then once you can have those control institutions, you can start to manage uh, approval projects, mitigation plans, incident management, et cetera. You don't have to have all of these at once though. Think of them as sequential. Um, most companies today are on the left side. Uh, they have a basic understanding and basic tracking in place. They don't have control institutions or management yet, um, but that's what we're espousing, that's what we're driving, that's what we think is gonna be important. Um, so that's our mission at AI Guardian, just 30 seconds on us. We brought all that together in a SaaS platform to help companies drive that, because we see a lot of companies struggling every day with it. Um, if you have, any of you have had uh, GRC systems, like uh, OneTrust for data privacy or other areas, very similar. Uh, you should have a single place where you have complete visibility on all the projects that are going on in AI. You should have an idea of the risks associated with them tied to standards like NIST. Um, and how to mitigate those as you move forward. You should understand your IP and what you ha own and what you can protect. And IP is a giant uh, blind spot right now for many companies, both on a defensive and an offensive perspective. On the defensive side, like I said, lawsuits are coming. 
Uh, most companies do not have a track of how they generated the content or code uh, that they're developing with AI. Um, that's going to hit hard when uh, pat patent infringements come and copyright infringement lawsuits come. Offense is the same way. Um, most companies want to own their own IP. They want to patent it. Um, U.S. Uh, patent law right now does not recognize machine-generated innovation. It's just too new of a thing for it to even understand under patent law, and law cases have been lost on that. But it does understand AI or machine-assisted innovation. So you need to have a track of who are the people who helped build this alongside the AI system that you're so proud of, so that in three years, when that person's long gone, you still have a track of what you've done and where with names attached to it so you can patent or hell, just get through a due diligence process without red flags popping up everywhere. And so that's what we focus on uh, at AI Guardian. It's an end-to-end -end SaaS platform built to do all those things easy and simply uh, in a responsible AI world. Okay. So the last few slides I have real quick. <clears throat> so what are your top priorities in this world? We've talked on some of these, but I'm going to expound a little bit. First, it is all hands on deck. I, whatever your role is for who's sitting out here today, um, you need to have a hand in uh, gen generative AI as, as a priority. Um, how it's going to improve how you do your work, um, how you build off of what other things that are going on and make your outputs better. And then second, again, I, I always come back to this, innovate, innovate, innovate. You should be running as fast as you can in a generative AI world right now. Um, thinking about those efficiency gains that you can, you can tackle and then the new offerings uh, that are going to come forward. All I ask in the middle of that is lead on AI governance and responsible AI. Make sure you have the guardrails um, in place to do that well, to think about these issues and tackle them not after they become a problem, uh, but as, as that project is ongoing. And honestly, the hardest part about that for almost anyone, because I've done a lot of these uh, kind of, kinds of programs at different places, it takes you being brave. Right? It's hard being the naysayer in a room. It's hard being the one going, well, what about this risk? Um, so you need a culture at a company that supports that, and you need to be brave within that culture and stand up and talk about it, um, because these are the things that will absolutely come back to bite you down the road. Um, the reason you need to focus on that, as I said earlier, laws and regulations are coming fast. Um, in technology, we kind of naysay uh, regulation. We go, oh, it's coming. It's going to go slow. Congress can never act. This is actually truly one of those areas where people are going to act quickly, because unlike most technology, most technology is back of the house. People don't really see it, feel it. This is going to be front of the house, and it's going to be in people's face. It's going to be affecting their lives fairly quickly. Um, and governments are going to act. This is why you have the EU um, AI Act moving so quickly. And it's already tied to data privacy legislation. So they've already got templates to build off of, and they're using those to do so to expedite what's going on. It's also, it's funny, most, most countries, if you do polling of regulation, um, almost no one wants regulation. It always pulls badly. This is the one topic in every country in the world that actually po pulls positively for regulation. So there's a positive incentive system for politicians to move quickly here. And we haven't even had that seminal moment yet where something goes sideways and starts to, to kind of poison people's opinion on this technology. Obviously, as that, as that everything moves forward, we all have good intentions. There's a lot of people in the world who have very terrible or bad uh, intentions, security, security threats are going to multiply 100x. I have spoken to, I can't tell you how many people in the banking industry who are scared senseless about their security levels in an AI world because you're putting extremely powerful technology in bad actors' hands. And it's technology that is easy to disseminate, to decentralize in a way. Um, so you're gonna have to amplify and honestly quadruple down on your security. And then the last one I wanna kind of build out a little bit in the last couple of slides here because of this audience, is the data one. Um, data is going to, the value of data is going to go through the roof, especially proprietary data. For all the reasons that were mentioned earlier, right? These models need vast amounts of structured data, clean data, to become what they are going to become. Um, this is why Bloomberg was right out of the gate with their own LLMs early in this wave, because they've got the world's largest um, data pool of financial information that's proprietary to them. You're going to see more of this happening. You're also going to see a lot of companies who allowed people access to their data to shut it off. Um, they're going to understand the value of it. They're going to start to wall it off. And so for the data that you have, your proprietary data, it's going to be critical 
You retain, organize, protect, and learn how to monetize that as your most precious asset as we move forward. So what does that mean in a Filecoin and data storage Gen A world? Um, I, I leave you with a few points on this very quickly. First, take that data storage and data security extremely seriously. It should be your priority, even if you don't think you're a data-centric company in, in most regards, you need to take it as seriously as if you were. Second, do focus on those decentralized networks. You need, in this world, there's going to be security breaches. It will happen. The question is, how do you minimize that when it does? You're going to need a backup plan to the backup plan to the backup plan uh, to make sure you're, you're good in this regard. Third, do work with trusted leaders who can keep pace with these security threats. You've already got a lot of folks like CrowdStrike and others coming in uh, and adapting what they do to this world. Um, but this is not a time to save money on that side. Um, the breaches will be serious. They will find uh, the weakest uh, links. Hell, I, I, I had to change rooms here at the MGM because of the security attack. They still don't have Wi-Fi on half the floors. Um, you're, you're going to have this in a much more widespread way, and you need to invest in it properly. And then make sure you clean up your data to empower data monetization. Okay? Make sure it's structured, clean, easy to understand, and built into other systems. All right. So in conclusion, take advantage of the transformative power of AI. Don't slow down. But please, please, please engage in responsible AI practices now. Think about responsible AI by design. Think about it at all three levels I talk about, operational, data and model, security. And then think about those four lines of defense. How do you understand what's going on, track, control, and manage it? Um, past that, understand the value of your data in this new world, new world we're dealing in, and invest in it. Make sure you've got it in the right place at the right time and secure. So on that note, uh, if you have any more uh, questions on, on this or AI Guardian, we're always happy to talk to you, or you can find us in these in environments. But thank you very much for your time today. Thanks. Woo.